So, Dr. Jason J. Campbell has posted a new installment of his Discussions in Philosophy series, which I think is interesting. And he asks the following question. How can we conceptualize analytic a posteriori knowledge? I think that if we want to get a better view of this subject, we're going to have to delve a little bit into the epistemology behind this question. So if you have experience in this and you already know what I'm about to say, please bear with me a little bit. Similar concepts can be found in other philosophers. Going back, all the way back to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, but our story is going to start with the Age of Enlightenment. Now, philosopher David Hume, writing in the empiricist tradition of philosophy, argued that there were two types of knowledge. Trivial knowledge, based on the definitions of words, or the relations of ideas, and profound knowledge based on the content which is provided to us by experience. Now, nowadays we would call the former analytic a priori, and the latter type of knowledge we would call synthetic a priori knowledge. And if you don't understand the terms I just used, don't worry, I'll explain what they mean in a minute. Now, this dichotomy had been assumed in all mainstream epistemology up until this point, but it's more, most often associated with Hume, and is as such now known as Hume's form. But it would scarcely be a few decades until a philosopher came to question this dichotomy, and that philosopher would turn out to be Immanuel Kant. Kant, in his attempt to reconcile the conflicting epistemologies of rationalism and empiricism, argued that there is not one dichotomy, but two, the analytic-synthetic and the a priori, a posteriori. Now, in the first dichotomy, we have analytic versus synthetic knowledge. Analytic knowledge is knowledge uh, that an object has a property that's contained in the definition of that object. For example, to say that an apple is a type of fruit is analytic since an apple is, by definition, a type of fruit. To say that a particular apple is red, however, is synthetic knowledge, not analytic knowledge, because apples are not red by definition. Indeed, you can have green apples, and that's a completely coherent concept. A green apple is still an apple, but something which isn't fruit can't be an apple. Therefore, to say that an apple is red would, if true, constitute synthetic knowledge, not analytic knowledge. However, the second dichotomy, a priori, a posteriori, deals not with the scope of knowledge, but with how you come to know it. A priori knowledge is knowledge derived from first principles, independently of any and all sensory experience. A posteriori knowledge, then, would be knowledge that is derived from experience. Now, if you put these terms together, you can view Hume's fork through the lens of Kant. As I said earlier, the trivial type of knowledge he mentioned is analytic a priori, since it deals with the definition of words and is derived independently of experience. The profound type that Hume mentioned would be synthetic a posteriori, since it is derived from experience, and it deals with propositions that have content other than, you know, definition. What Kant's insight was, was that these are not the only types of knowledge. Indeed, if you look at the four terms there, there are two other ways to combine them. Synthetic a priori, which would be knowledge derived independently of experience, but not from the mere definitions of the concepts, and analytic a posteriori, which be knowledge derived from experience, but contained within uh, definitions of words. Now, of those two, only the former, synthetic a priori, is dealt with in Kant's philosophy, and many concepts that Kant brings up are considered to be synthetic a priori. The 
main examples are mathematics, metaphysics, morality, aesthetics, and politics. Those are all topics Kant discusses, and all of them are considered by Kant to be knowable synthetic a priori. And again, for those of you who already know all of everything that I just said, the preceding overview is likely to have been rather boring, but uh, it was necessary for those who don't already know it, and thanks for sticking with me with this far. And for those of you who didn't already know, I hope I've provided enough context to answer the question now. For both of you, I promise it's about to get interesting. The question is, how might we conceptualize analytic a posteriori knowledge, the type of knowledge that Kant himself never used? Now on the surface, this question might seem rather silly. If something is knowable merely through the definitions of words, then it should also be knowable independently of experience. How then can analytic knowledge possibly be a posteriori? Uh, this is precisely the argument that Kant gave, and to this day, the majority of philosophers accept the coherency of synthetic a priori knowledge, but not analytic a posteriori knowledge. And indeed, the argument goes that since analytic a posteriori knowledge is incoherent, it can't be conceptualized. However, we can see that this isn't necessarily the case. Notice that Kant specifically aimed to separate the analytic synthetic dichotomy from the a priori a posteriori dichotomy. As a result, nowhere in the definition of analytic knowledge is it stated that it must be a priori. What this means is that if it is true that analytic knowledge must be a priori, this fact would be known synthetically, not analytically. In other words, it's not known from the definition of analytic or from the definition of a priori. So it's not necessarily the case that analytic knowledge is, an, is a priori, even if that does happen to be the case. So how can we conceive of such knowledge if it does happen to exist? Now, the interesting thing, I think, is that once we delve into this question, we find a hint of irony. One way of conceptualizing the knowledge that Kant himself rejected might be found in the works of Kant himself. Let's take, for example, a look at one concept that Kant holds to be synthetic a priori. Uh, morality. Now, roughly, Kant's aim is to develop a moral philosophy from the concept of freedom, and what he finds is that the concept of freedom contains that of morality. In other words, morality is part of the definition of freedom if freedom is to be a logically consistent concept. And this idea, by the way, was later echoed by Hegel. It seems rather interesting, then, that he calls this synthetic knowledge. Even if it's saying something about the world, he's deriving it from definitions of concepts. So it therefore must be analytic by definition. It's also interesting that Kant calls it a priori. There might be a priori elements to it, but in order for the concept of freedom to have any coherent content whatsoever, you have to presume the existence of agents, and these agents can be free or unfree. The existence of these agents, however, can only be known a posteriori by observing other agents. And by the way, uh, if you can prove otherwise, you would be recognized as the greatest philosopher of this century for having get destroyed solipsism. So, I think that we can both agree, though, that morality is now both analytic and a posteriori, which means that one way to conceptualize this knowledge is to look at how Kant derives his moral philosophy, and that's independently of whether or not you agree with Kant's moral philosophy, but we don't even need to get into these abstract philosophical concepts on which we don't all agree, 
in order to find an example. Consider the following proposition P. Water is a molecule composed of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Is P analytic or synthetic? A priori or a posteriori? Well, let's examine what the proposition is actually stating. Most people would agree that water, by definition, is the molecule H2O. Actually, it's a dynamic aggregate on many variations of this molecule, such as the ions hydronium and hydroxide, but H2O is good enough for our current purposes. Now, if this is the case, then P follows trivially from this definition. Premise 1, the molecule H2O can only hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Premise 2. Water is defined as a molecule H2O. Therefore, water is composed only of hydrogen and oxygen. It follows that P is derived from analytic knowledge, not synthetic knowledge. So the next question is, is it a priori or a posteriori? Well, if it's a priori, then it shouldn't require empirical investigation in order to figure out but as it turned out, it did require that. Water was originally thought to be an element in itself. It was a relatively recent discovery that it was even composed of anything else. And it took empirical investigation by the early chemists in order to know that water was, in fact, the molecule H2O. Therefore, P cannot be a priori knowledge. It must be a posteriori knowledge so, I've established that P must be both analytic and a posteriori, contrary to our intuitions that such knowledge cannot exist. Now, of course, I anticipate numerous criticisms of this argument, and I might pursue those in another video, but it's irrelevant to this video because I'm not trying to prove or disprove the existence of analytic a posteriori knowledge. I'm trying to show how we would conceptualize it if it did exist, which is how I'm interpreting uh, Jason's question. Also, showing how to conceptual it is a major hurdle to showing its existence, since a major hang-up that people have with this kind of knowledge is our inability to conceive of it. So if I can show that we can conceive of it, that eliminates one major obstacle to its acceptance. Now, the following is going to be slightly off topic, but it, I think it's relevant. Uh, I'll just leave you with a little taste of something I've been considering. What precisely does analytic knowledge actually entail? Well, as I said, it has to do with the definition of words. But then, how do we know what the definitions of words are? Well, this is something we learn by interacting with other people when we learn languages. In other words, we learn it a posteriori. Now, the viewer is left now with a choice to make. Do you think knowledge of meaning is analytic or synthetic? Now, let me examine the consequences quickly of both options. If it's analytic, then we have another example of analytic a posteriori knowledge. But what if it's synthetic? That would imply that analytic knowledge is derived from a form of synthetic knowledge. Put another way, analytic knowledge is merely a type of synthetic knowledge, and therefore there is no analytic-synthetic distinction. Uh, the viewer, then, is... I'll just leave you with this. Which horn of the dilemma do you choose, and why do you choose it? See ya.